Hi there, it's John Pushkar. I'm here today with another episode to try to keep you safe in the world of fuels and fired equipment. In my part of the country here in Cleveland, Ohio, we've been getting rain for days and days and days. I know that there's many parts in the Northeast that have been inundated with floodwaters. I know that parts of Western Europe are experiencing even worse tragedies. So there's got to be equipment that's been damaged by water, by flooding, parts of fuel systems that have been underwater. And today, I want to review with you some important topics for getting this equipment back into service. These all come out of an article that I published many years ago. I'll provide a link to that article in case you'd like to read the whole thing. It covers matters relating to equipment reliability and to recovering with this equipment after flooding. There's no place else you can get this kind of information on the internet. If you want more of this kind of content, please subscribe. And if you'd hit the like button, that would be a wonderful thing as well. Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. So I'm going to cover 10 specific topics with you here during this session. I'm going to go through quickly. There's not a lot of detail on each. Of course, nothing replaces a competent, experienced individual who can review this equipment and test all the safety devices, and we're going to get to that too. But this is just kind of give you some awareness and some concepts of things that you need to be checking. The first item is to review all vent lines coming from components of the fuel train system. Vent lines, according to NFPA 54, the National Fuel Gas Code, up until recently, you didn't need to use pipe dope to assemble them. They're one of the least cared for piping systems on a fuel train because typically they're not expected to be under pressure at all. So if these vent lines have gotten wet, if they've been underwater, there's a good chance you've now got water into the diaphragm side of a regulator or into a fuel train. You need to disassemble the vent piping systems, check for water, make sure that they're dry. Number two, refractory dry out is crucial. There are many different types of refractory. So refractory is that rock-like, cementaceous type, sometimes fibrous type material that can withstand thousands of degrees. It's there to protect carbon steel components, which are often the structure of the thermal envelope of whatever you're operating, and sometimes the material that the burner systems are made out of. Refractory can absorb water. If you start to heat up a system that's got a lot of water in the refractory, remember water expands at about 1,600 times to one. Refractory does not. You start to vaporize the water in the refractory, and guess what? You tear that refractory apart right away. Some refractory will just crumble after it's gotten wet. If you don't have refractory, you don't have integrity of the firebox, only very bad things will happen. So be careful with refractory. If it's a little bit wet, you might be able to operate on low fire to dry it out. You might just operate on pilot. You may put in auxiliary heaters just to blow heat into the firebox. I would recommend you contact a refractory installer. They've got special equipment. They've got knowledge about how to dry out refractory. Breaking up refractory is very expensive, takes a long time to fix, if it can be repaired at all. Number three, control panels and electrical equipment. Kind of obvious here, if you've gotten control panels wet inside, you don't want to energize them. You want to very carefully dry them out. It's quite likely that where you have contacts, you could have corroded contacts and relays. Might be able to use some contact cleaner, if not, you'll be replacing relays. And if you've gotten PLCs wet or burner management systems wet, you're likely going to need to replace them. If you've got buried fuel tanks containing fuel oil, maybe as a backup fuel, and you've got water mixed in with the fuel oil, 
Well, most likely you're into then a salvage effort to find someone who will take that material. If you can drain off some of the water, it's likely you're gonna to need to dose that fuel oil with biocides as well. There are many bacteria which like to consume hydrocarbons and oil. If you start to pump this through your system, you'll gum everything up, including strainers, burner tips. It'll just be a mess. So there's gotta be some very, very careful attention given to fuel oils. All the safety interlocks need to be tested. This is something you should be doing on a regular basis anyway, but for sure you need to carefully go through these. What they are very much depends on what kind of equipment we're talking about, whether it's a boiler or a thermal oxidizer or some type of oven or furnace. The back of NFPA 86 has an appendices for what these should be for equipment that is subject to NFPA 86, ovens and furnaces, ASME CSD1, Controls and safety devices for automatically fired boilers also has lists of what these are likely to be. All the fuel train valves and manual isolation valves need to be seat leakage tested. Again, this should already be a regular thing on your schedule. If it's not, there are instructions for how to do this that are associated with many fuel train valves that you would buy. They're usually in the instruction manual for installing and maintaining these. It's also discussed in NFPA 86. Number seven, burners should be removed and inspected. So especially if they're ribbon type burners, you've got small orifices where gas comes out, you've got small orifices where the fuel air mixture comes up through and gets ignited. These often rust anyway. If those burners got wet, you've probably really accelerated the corrosion. So make sure you check these, otherwise you'll have a bunch of clogged up rusted areas you won't get a good fuel air mixture coming out and you're likely to cause overheating and or sooting of the firebox number eight you need to check fuel air ratios again there's usually a gas ring or orifices associated with burners there are then air passages any of this could have dirt that washed in with the floodwaters it all needs to be carefully cleaned even in little premix burner systems, there are orifices, both where gas comes in and induces air, and then also at the burner tips, and especially with pilot tips, they're very small holes. So all of this, again, needs to be removed and cleaned. Then you need a flue gas analyzer, and you need to be checking fuel air ratios from low fire to high fire, and then reversing that from high fire to low fire to make sure that you have repeatability. Number nine, combustion air fans need to be cleaned. If you deposit dirt on forward curved blades, for example, if you start to fill in the little pockets, you change the shape of the airfoil, you change the flow characteristics of the fan. Never a good thing. You might be running out of air at some point as you increase the firing rate. You'll change the fuel air ratio and only bad things will happen. And last but not least, if you're gonna start this equipment and try to operate it, remember there's a process to it. It means that you first do a dry fire attempt and you watch linkages, make sure they're all moving very smoothly and you make sure that the purge occurs correctly. At some point when you're confident in that, you then light off just a pilot. After lighting the pilot and locking the BMS into pilot for a while, so you can observe the pilot, make sure it's large enough, make sure you have a good pilot signal. Only then you would release to main flame. You would make sure that it releases and holds at low fire. You evaluate low fire for a while, make sure you got a good low fire signal and the flame is very stable and all the gas pressure regulation is very stable. Then you walk it through its paces from low fire to high fire and again back. Also a good time to review emergency procedures. Make sure gas can be shut off for each piece of equipment and even back at the main and discuss with folks what's gonna happen if things unexpectedly take a turn for the worse, meaning some type of an explosion, unexpected flame outs. Make sure these things are reported and people don't try to light off by themselves thinking, well, it was just some transitory thing. Again, I hope this helps. I know there's a lot of anguish out there when equipment's been underwater. 
I know that people are stressed. I know that parts and materials and even service people are somewhat short in supply these days. I hope this helps you in some small way. And again, if you like this content, want more of it, the only place to get it on the internet is at this channel. So once again, thank you. Stay safe out there, because the life that you save, it just might be yours. Hi, it's John Pushkar. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to know about more ways that I can help, you can check out my website at www.prescientts.com. There you'll find information about the Prescient Technical Services Online School, my book, Fuels and Combustion System Safety, What You Don't Know Can Kill You, and also about some of the consulting projects that I've been providing to clients for the past 40 years. Things like implementing inspection and testing programs on a corporate enterprise-wide level, things like reviewing and commenting on capital equipment purchases that involve combustion equipment, and even being a legal expert if things go really wrong. Once again, thank you for attending, and remember, be safe out there. The life you save, it just might be yours.